Hello, and welcome to the Middle of Culture, Episode 1. My name is Peter Jones. And I'm Braden Jones. And we're here today at the end of 2021 and the beginning of 2022 to talk about some of our favorite and in some cases perhaps not so favorite uh, pieces of music that came out in the last year. Was there anything this year that sort of stood out to you, Braden? Yeah, so I do have some things I wanted to chat about, but first I wanted to kind of make a baseline. What kind of music do you mostly listen to for people who maybe don't know you as well as I know you? Because I could tell the <laughs> listeners what you listen to, but why don't you tell the listeners what you listen to? So I'm kind of well known at work as the surgeon who listens to death metal in the operating room. <laughs> and I kind of didn't ever think that was actually going to be something that happened, but it did. And the funny thing is, is that people at work kind of love it. Even the people who don't really like that kind of music, it's so different than what they listen to the rest of the time that people will come in my room and they're just like, hey, what are we listening to today? And then they hear it and they're like, wow, that's kind of cool. <laughs> nice. But what about you? Because, you know, it's interesting. I would say, I don't know, 15, maybe more than 15 years ago, you and I had pretty similar tastes in music. We very much did. There were obviously some variances, but there was a lot of overlap. And I feel like in the last few years, our tastes have diverged some. A bit. Uh, I don't listen to nearly as much uh, heavy metal uh, as you do. Uh, there are a few, like, I'd say sub-genres of metal that I still uh, dabble in from time to time. But I definitely would be a, a much wider listener these days. Um, I listen to a lot of, you know, a little bit of everything. I like a lot of post-rock. I listen to a lot of post-rock, uh, avant-garde classical, jazz, uh, some pop, a little bit of everything. Some country, especially alt-country, not like the, you know bad alt rock with a twang that is on the top 40 <laughs> country stations, but like, you know, alt country. Uh, so I listen to a little bit of everything these days. And I think that'll be reflected uh, in the list that I've put together. My top 10 this year uh, definitely reflects, I think the breadth of my listening uh, just cause I, I'm always looking for something that just makes me feel something. So that's, that's my biggest criteria. Do I feel something while I'm listening to this? And you know, that's interesting because I definitely noticed that just for fun last night, I had a few minutes and I kind of went through the list that you had sent me and listened to at least maybe not even a whole song, but at least ran through parts of a couple different songs of everything that was on your list. And and you're right. It, it, there's a, a, an impressive breadth to the music that you've selected to talk about today. So I'm looking forward to hearing about these things. Yeah, me too. I'm excited to hear. I did the same sort of thing when you sent over your list. I uh, popped open my, uh, you know, Spotify and started clicking through into some of these albums. And I was like, I can see why these are the sorts of things Peter was into this year. So <laughs> we should chat about them. I think so too. It'll be fun. Well, we're going to start off. And before we get to the good, we've got to talk about a little bit of bad. Oh boy. You know, I'll, I'll preface this by saying, I don't think these are necessarily bad bad albums. I mean, there were some real stinkers that came out this year, but we're not going to waste our time talking about those. But these were ones that uh, definitely I found, and I think, you know, you found some of these to just not kind of live up to what we were hoping for. And in part of that, it's because the bands that were releasing them have hit such incredible heights in the past that these most recent outings just didn't do it for me. I'm going to start off with one that I think is unique to my list, and that is the album Aphelion from Leprous. So Leprous is an interesting band, and their first four albums were really, really good. Uh, progressive metal, very progressive. A lot of different you know, variety, um, vocal techniques, all sorts of things throughout all these albums. And then the last three have just been sort of a slide into what I would generously call progressive pop rock. And I guess the generous part is still calling it progressive. I mean, yeah, it doesn't necessarily meet your standard song structures and stuff, but I don't know. This last one, I was really trying to get into it, and I was trying to tell myself, hey, you know, it's okay. They're more mellow. You're getting older. You should be getting more mellow, too. <laughs> I'm not, necessarily. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, I don't either. But I tried to listen to, to this album, and I just, I can't really do it. Like I can listen to a song or two. And then after that, I just find myself getting bored. Whereas again, with, with previous Leprous albums, I mean, it was start to finish. You just wanted to keep listening because 
each song was going to be different, but they were still going to really hit you in some way. And I just haven't found that on, on any of these last albums and, and especially this most recent just kind of left me cold. So, you know, I'm, I'm always hoping for big things from Leprous and I didn't get it this year. I, I don't know how you call yourself Leprous and do like pop rock. Like this needs to be a gore grind band. Get the heck out of here. Right. You I need mean, to be on a double header with pig destroyer. Come on. <laughs> Speaking of, I, you know, that was still one of the more intense concerts I've ever been to was pig destroyer. Pig destroyer puts on a show, man. I, I saw them and converge in a live oh. on a double header. That oh. was a show. Oh, Converge and Pig Destroyer. So Pig Destroyer actually co-headlined with Neurosis when I saw them at, at Crucial Fest a couple years ago. So Oh, that would have been a hell of a show. It was it was something else. Well, let's talk about two other disappointments because, again, you and I kind of mentioned that we shared these. Yeah. Let's talk about Senjutsu from Iron Maiden. What do you think? It's just a bad one. Sometimes they put out bad ones. Sometimes Maiden does really great work. Brave New World, good album. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, but Virtual Eleven, bad album. Yes. And uh, Matter of Life and Death, good album. Even if it's real messy because they recorded it live and you can tell that it's recorded live and it makes it real messy. Matter of Life and Death, good album. Senjutsu, not a good one. It's just a bad one. They did bad. They did a bad job. They're boring. That's the biggest thing. If a Maiden album is forgettable that is the most damning thing i can say about it because most maiden songs sound similar but i can tell them apart yeah. but the senjutsu album i was just like i don't nothing there's nothing here for me this is boring and like whew, that's it's not what you want from an iron maiden album it just felt old and it felt boring you know i couldn't agree more um i love the fact that these guys are pushing 70 and they're still rocking but at the same time i'm like guys it's it's sounding the same and there's absolutely no sense of editing. I mean, that's, that's the biggest thing. You know, I'm, I'm one for, I'm a big fan of long stuff. There's no, there's no tightness to the production anymore. And again, sometimes that works out. Okay. Matter of life and death is a messy album. It's too long by half. Every single song on it should be two thirds the length that it is because they're all too long. They needed to be edited. They needed a producer to come in and be like, no, 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 no. This does not need a third version of this chorus. It needs to stop two minutes earlier, but it's still a good album because it still has like a propulsion to it. Yep. And it has like a rawness of being in the studio together that this one is just, it's all the messiness of matter of life and death, but with none of the, none of the verve that that album has. And so it's just bad. And, and really for me, no memorable hooks. You know, that's the thing is nothing. There's nothing that sticks in my head. Nothing that makes me go, even if I don't want to listen to the whole song again, I'm like, okay, I got to listen to that part again. Cause that was pretty cool. And there's none of that on here. Nothing. Which is, it just breaks my heart a little bit because I love Maiden. They still put on an amazing live show, but uh, the, yeah, this was just not what I was hoping for. Indeed. And you know, I got to say the same thing about Gojira's new one, uh, Fortitude. I will say, I know you said that these weren't necessarily bad albums. I will say, I think Fortitude is objectively a bad album, which is a real <laughs> shame because some of Gojira's earlier stuff still ranks for me as some of the more fun I've had listening to heavy metal. But Fortitude was just a, like a stinker all around. It was very bad. Yeah. From Mars to Sirius is it for me. That was when Gojira peaked. I know a lot of people think that, you know, the couple albums that came after that were even better. I think they're good. Mm, I'm with you. But I'm with you. Man, these last two, both Magma and Fortitude, just there will be a track here and there that I'm like, OK, here's some hints of the old Gojira again. But just the other night I was listening to my 2021 playlist and it was on shuffle and a song from this album popped up and I was like, wow, this is pretty good. Maybe I judged this wrong. And then it just hit this middle bridge that just took all of the wind out of my sails, slowed the whole thing down. Yep. And, and I was bored. And I, I tried to listen to it. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm skipping. I'm going on to the next song. This just isn't, I don't know, it just didn't hold my interest or pull me in, in part because there is so much of that, those breaks in momentum, whether it's a whole song that breaks the momentum of the album or a portion of the song that just feels like it puts the brakes on it. And, and it just didn't work for me. Yeah. 
I, I'm with you. It just felt stultifying to listen to. I tried. I listened to it like two times. I remember I remember sitting in my desk at work. It was before I moved offices. So I remember sitting at my old office in the old desk and trying to listen to it while all my coworkers were at lunch and just thinking, I do I just not like this band anymore? Is this me or is this the band? <laughs> and in this case, I think it's the band because I went back to From Mars to Sirius and I was like, no, 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 no. This is still good. This is still yes. awesome. I, I'm, I'm down yes. with this still. Absolutely. I, and I'm with you a hundred percent. And this is, you know, this is the uh, cantankerous part in me, the old man yelling people to get off my lawn, I guess. Man, on the internet, Gojira is just like, everybody's hailing them as the second coming of progressive metal. And I'm like, no. first of all, I don't think they're really that progressive. No, they're not. And second of all, they're losing steam as far as I'm concerned. Uh-huh. I felt the same way, like, obviously it's a very different vibe, but I felt the same way about this Gojira album as, oh, now I can't think of the name of it, the Opeth album where it suddenly was folk music instead of heavy metal, and I was just like, nope, I'm not. I respect that this is what you want to do, but this is not what I'm here for. Opeth, that'd be a whole conversation for us, but I'll just say that, you know, Opeth, still some of my favorite albums of all time. Yep. Have not been able to listen to their last four albums start to finish once. It's just, eh, like I say, go with God, do what you want to do, but it doesn't have to be with me. All right. So what were some of the, what were some of the things that you thought were better this last year than they, than you maybe thought they were going to be uh, kind of to counterpoint with those uh, disappointments that you were hoping for something better? So I'm going to start with Chevelle. Now, I think you actually might have been the one who got me into Chevelle with their debut album, Point Number One, which I still actually would agree, argue is their best album. Oh, undoubtedly. But I haven't been interested in them for years. And suddenly I saw that they had a new album come out. And I don't even know if I want to try and say the name of Neriatus or something like that. But I listened to it. And I guess the biggest thing that surprised me is I didn't want to turn it off. Like I wanted to keep listening to it. And so I ended up listening to the whole album and I listened to it a couple different times in a row and, and actually, you know, kind of was like, wow, this is, this is pretty good. I'm not going to lie and say that I've gone back to it a lot and it certainly isn't going to make the end of, you know, my top list for the end of the year, but I listened to it way more than I have listened to the last at least three or so Chevelle albums. And so that was a pleasant surprise to go, no, nah, something about this is still connecting with me and, and, and I'm enjoying it. And, uh, you know, I thought it was interesting to see that, uh, Vanessa, our sister, she actually really enjoyed that too. And, and kind of mentioned that to us. Yeah. I know that she, uh, she's always been a bigger fan of it than I think either of us were. Um, and so I'm glad that she really enjoyed it. I haven't really had a chance to listen to it yet. Um, but I probably will, you know, at, at you and her's recommendation, uh, I'll probably give it a spin one of these here days. Yeah. I think it's definitely worth listening to the other one that, again, I think was better than it had any right to be was Colors 2 by Between the Buried and Me. Again, another band that I think you turned me on to with their album, Alaska. Such a good album. And that one didn't really click for me that much. I still like it, but for me, it was the follow-up. It was Colors, that everything just clicked. And I was like, okay, love this band. Love what they're doing. And... That's a tough act to follow up, and, and it's kind of a ballsy move to say, uh -huh. hey, we're going to call this the sequel to kind of what most people consider our most groundbreaking album. And so it sets some expectations pretty high, and for the most part, I think Colors 2 pulls it off, actually. Which is, you know, it's nice that they set that bar, and it's nice that it sounds like they cleared it, because... Uh... Yeah, I Alaska is still my favorite of their albums. I really enjoyed Colors, but I probably haven't listened to it in a decade. So seeing it on your list again made me think to myself, you know, I should probably go back and listen to Between the Buried and Me again. Yeah, you know, you definitely, at least I definitely have to be in the mindset where I can appreciate their kitchen sink approach to music because Between the Buried and Me is one of those bands that they will leave absolutely no stone unturned. They'll turn it over and see what notes they can find underneath it. But sometimes that actually works, and it works surprisingly well on colors, too. I still don't think it's as good as the first, but again, considering that they were calling it the sequel to that, it holds up pretty well. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that they have uh, have hit a stride again, at least to, of some ilk with you. Yeah, no, it's definitely worth listening to. So 
Next, I'm going to run through some honorable mentions for me um, really quick because my list is bloated and I don't want to spend too much time talking, but there were a few I wanted to mention. Um, first, I was going to mention Coherence by Bellacor. So Bellacor is from Australia and they play kind of a progressive melodic death metal. And I really like Coherence. It came late in the year. I didn't listen to it as much as I would have liked, but it's it's a nice take on kind of their brand of, of melodic death metal. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And it's one that I'm definitely going to be going back and listening to some more. Um, have you ever heard Emma Ruth Rundle? I don't know that I have. So Emma Ruth Rundle is going to have some connections that you know. And I want to say there is a connection with Explosions in the Sky. Okay, that's a band I've listened to quite a, quite a bit of in my day. Yeah, so she, she's got these post-rock um, connections. And I actually saw her, she opened for Cult of Luna, which was the last concert I saw before COVID shut down everything. Um, but it was just Emma Ruth Rundle and her guitar. No backing band, nothing like that. And it was a really cool raw show. And this last year she released Engine of Hell. And Engine of Hell is the same sort of thing where it's Emma Ruth Rundle with either piano or acoustic guitar. And that's it. And it just is, it feels very personal, very intimate, and in a lot of ways, really raw. The first track on their uh, return might be my favorite song of the year. Oh, wow. It's hard for me to listen to it and not choke up a little bit. Wow. It is beautiful. Her voice is emotive. I think you'd actually really dig this one. It sounds like my sort of thing, especially, you know, I, as we've been chatting, I pulled up her Wikipedia page. It looks like she was actually on one of the later Red Sparrows albums. I really enjoy Red Sparrows still. That's what it was. It was Red Sparrows, not Explosions in the Sky. That's it. Yeah, I'm still, I, I really enjoy Red Sparrows. Also looking to see that her divorce basically happened and was finalized while this album was recorded and written definitely speaks to the rawness that you're talking about. Um, definitely sounds like the sort of thing I would be into. So I'm going to have to check this out. Yeah, it's, it's really good. And again, I didn't listen to it as much as some of the other albums. So it didn't make the crack the top of the list, but definitely worth mentioning. A couple other really quick ones. Evergrey. Uh, I love Evergrey. I've always loved Evergrey ever since I first discovered them. I saw them on tour for their previous album, The Atlantic, a year, couple of years ago. Super cool guys was right up at the front of the thing, you know, getting high fives from band members during the show and um, escape of the Phoenix. Their album from this last year is an excellent sort of distillation of what makes Evergrey Evergrey. And that is, you know, powerful sounding sort of progressive metal with just really, really emotive vocals. Tom Englund has just a voice that just makes you feel a little sad inside. Doesn't matter how happy what he's singing sounds like his voice is going to make it sound a little sad. And and I love that fact. Um, It's a great album. Again, the biggest drawback is it sounds like ever. (laughs) You know what you're getting with Evergrey. This is absolutely an Evergrey album. It's not breaking any molds, but it's a really damn good Evergrey album. Interesting. You know, I haven't listened to them also in about a decade. Um, But yeah, like you said, when you, when you want that melodic progressive metal, Evergrey is right there for you. Yeah, definitely. And honestly, I'd put the next album on my list, Exodus, Persona Non Grata, in sort of the same camp as Evergrey in that if you like Exodus, you know exactly what you're getting. You're getting thrashy, thrashy American metal. Um, Gary Holt, the lead guitarist for Exodus, you know, he's got an amazing guitar sound. It's just crunchy. It's dirty. It's heavy. And Zetro's vocals you know, you either love them or you hate them <laughs> or you just grow to get used to them. But they're all over this album. And it is, I mean, this is just like, you're pissed off. Listen to there Exodus. You you're lifting something really heavy. Listen to Exodus. You want to like really get pumped up, crank up some Exodus. It'll do it for you. Not breaking any molds, but it's, it's as Exodus as Exodus gets. <laughs> See, you and I are just different people. When I'm pissed off, I don't want to listen to angry music. I want to like listen to something to chill me. So, you know, we're just different people. <laughs> and see, for me, I'm exercising my demons. I'm getting rid of them. So there you go. There you go. I like that. And speaking of exercising demons, the next album on the list, Oxidized by Frontierer, is 
I mean, in the little document I was making up, I think I just wrote WTF. I mean, really. Every time I listen to Frontier, all I can think is, what is this? It is loud. It is chaotic. It has so much effects and all sorts of things that just make it abrasive, abrasive music. But it just gets at something kind of raw and primal in me. It's pure chaos. It distilled into just this musical form. And I love what they're doing. There's nobody else out there that's doing things quite as crazy and insane as they are. The closest would probably be Car Bomb. And even then, I think Frontier is heavier. Interesting. Uh, A couple others really quick. Impure Wilhelmina, Antidote. It's this really interesting, almost British pop kind of vocals mixed with this heavy metal. And um, this is probably their best album ever. As someone who's really enjoyed the previous Impure Wilhelmina albums, I like this one a lot. I just didn't listen to it as much as I think I should have if I really wanted this to be higher up in the list. Sure. And I would say that the next one, Deceiver by Chemis, kind of follows in that same vein where it's Chemis. If you like Chemis's doomy sort of traditional heavy metal style, this is a good example of it. It's not as good as their second album, hunted but it still is a really solid album and one that i enjoy coming back to the last two albums i'll mention are interesting in that you know you said earlier when you like listening to music and and kind of music that you look for is something that makes you feel something yeah these two albums are gonna make you feel something that's what i like and that something is super sad (laughs) moon flowers by swallow the sun Swallow the Sun is this kind of death doom band. I believe they're Finnish. Their lead guitarist, um, his significant other, Elias Stanbridge, died a number of years ago, tragically in an accident. And their previous album was really him kind of coping with that. Well, it turns out he still had more coping he needed to do. So Moonflowers is more of that. It is the ultimate kind of sad boy, melodic death metal with doomy overtones but lots of clean, mellow passages and things that just kind of rip on your heartstrings. It kind of, I, I was going to say, in regards to the, the Moonflowers one, it kind of sounds like a death metal version of Mount Erie, where you're like, this person went through a, I don't know if you're familiar with Mount Erie, they're like an indie rock uh, group. Well, I guess it's one person really huh, at this point. I haven't heard of them. But the same sort of thing happened where his his wife died um, like while she was pregnant with their child. Oh, jeez. Um, and... The t- three albums that have come out since that happened are three of the most heartbreaking things that you will ever listen to. Um, they're the sort of thing that you turn on when you really want a good cry because you are going to cry. Um, but it's really uh, it- it's really instructive to see someone working through the stages of grief over the course of these years and over the course of these very, very intimate but still released to the public um, kind of memorials to this person that they've lost. Um, and, and and so it sounds like if you wanted a heavier version of that, that Swallow the Sun would definitely uh, fulfill that for one. It definitely would. And, you know, they've always kind of been in that sad boy, melodic death doom uh, camp. But I'd say these last two albums of theirs have just really been heart-wrenching. And, you know, even the sure. artwork on this last one, uh, Juha, the the guitarist, he, he painted the cover art and all of the red that you see in the cover art is his blood so you know that's uh k- kind of where he was when he was working on this Oof. Um, clouds is very similar in that again just it's sad it's morose i mean especially on this one there's some guest vocals and one of the tracks has uh, aaron stainthorpe of my dying bride doing vocals on it And it's just, it's the warmest, fuzziest blanket of despair you could ever wrap yourself in. And so if that's something you're going for, Clouds, any album by theirs, but this is another good example of that. And, and, you know, sometimes, like you said, sometimes you want to feel something. Sometimes you want to, sometimes you want to cry. Yeah, you do. And, and you know, what better way to do it? I think than with some good music. Amen. Well, there's kind of our list of, again, sort of my honorable mentions, some disappointments, some surprises, but let's get down to the meat of this and let's talk about our favorite albums of the year. And do you want to go ahead and start? Uh, I will. I'm going to look at my list and I'm going to work on it backwards because I put my very favorite one at the very top. Uh, So I'm going to go backwards. (laughs) Um, 
And my first one is uh, Jubilee by Japanese Breakfast. I don't know if you're familiar with Japanese Breakfast. I am not. Um, it, she is a, uh, I would say, kind of an indie indie rock person, very in this vein of like Mitski. I don't know if you're familiar with Mitski either. Uh, Mitski's Be the Cowboy is one of the best albums of the last decade. Extremely highly recommended if you want to listen to some really uh, heartbreaking uh, heartbreakingly beautiful and lonely is the best way I would describe Mitski's music. It's very lonely. Uh, Interesting. And Japanese Breakfast feels that way to a certain extent, a little less lonely perhaps, but her new album Jubilee uh, really was kind of a revelation for me uh, regarding uh, her work. I had listened to her previous albums and I thought they were good, not great. They were the sort of thing that like if I were in that kind of Mitski mood, but didn't want to listen to Mitski again, I would pick up Japanese breakfast, but Jubilee, I felt like really pushed her, uh, her ability to, to write a good hook, uh, over the edge. Um, the cat, the songs are very catchy. The, uh, the melodies really stick in your brain. Uh, they, they really have a tactile feel to them. Um, and, and you definitely, uh, at least in my case, I definitely think about them after I'm done listening to it. I listen to that album and I am going to be humming those songs the rest of the day, nice. which is as as high a, a praise as you can give indie rock, I think, uh, that there is. You know, one thing about listening to metal, which I have a lot some metal on here, too. I like listening to it. I ain't going to be humming it afterwards. <laughs> you don't hum. Uh, you, you you enjoy listening to the new Mastodon album. You don't hum the new Mastodon album the rest of the day afterwards. No, that's very true. Sometimes I want something like true. that. And 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 that's what that's what Japanese breakfast gives me is is really good hooks that will kind of stick in your brain and kind of fester in there throughout the day. Um, and she just has a really great voice too um, that just is very melodic, very 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 sonorous. Uh, and I just really enjoyed the album. I was really impressed by it. It really, uh, as I said, I I had enjoyed her music to a certain extent in the past, but wasn't something that I was going to, you know, shout from the rafters, but her newest album really, really pushed it over to the edge for me. Nice. That's awesome. It, definitely not something I'm familiar with, but something that I am I'm intrigued to check out, you, you know, probably isn't going to be something that I'm playing a whole lot, but something that would be very interesting to kind of, yeah, you know, discover a little bit. That sounds cool. Yeah. She also put out a, a memoir this last year that I read uh, called crying in H Mart. Uh, which is about her growing up and being like a child of Asian immigrants um, and that sort of stuff. Uh, and it's and it's, there's a lot about Korean culture and Korean food uh, because uh, I believe her mother is from Korea. Uh, and it was really interesting to read that book and then see the album that was kind of produced at the same time that she was working on that book and kind of dealing with those same uh, those same emotions. Yeah, no, that sounds interesting and. I just think that emphasizes, again, one of the things I love about music so much is its ability to tell stories, to tell you about people, for people to express themselves in a way that, you know, you learn more about them, you learn more about maybe a different culture, but you also get to listen to some great music. Indeed. So I'm going to do the same. And you, I'm going to go backwards just like you did. So. All right. So what's, what? yeah, what's what's your number 10 album of the year? Um, late addition to the list because I listened to this album a ton when it came out and then kind of forgot about it until I was again going through the the playlist for 2021 albums. And that is uh, Carving the Fires of a Ket by Crescent. So Egyptian-themed death metal, yeah, it's been done. Nile has been doing that for years, except Nile is from Georgia, and at least Crescent is from Egypt. So they've already got that going for him. Okay. But something about this, their ability to blend kind of these Middle Eastern and Egyptian sounds, um, you know, musical stylings and everything into just brutal, crushing death metal. It just it ticked a whole bunch of boxes for me. This is their third full length. Their first one, not great. Their second one, pretty doggone good. This third one, so much better than their previous album. And I think just shows an amazing upward trajectory for these guys. Um I love it. It's cool. Uh, it sounds unique still, even amongst other just heavy death metal because of those Egyptian elements to the music and these more kind of traditional sounds and and styles that it's it's 
It's definitely cool. It's definitely cool. That sounds very cool. I I love that melding of of different styles and different uh, e- even when it comes to like different compositional rules because I know that you know in in lots of non Western musical traditions they use entirely different scales and entirely different yep. modes of production and different tones that that we don't even engage with when it comes to you know predominantly European music. So I love to hear stories about bands who who are combining those those uh, forms together yeah and and they do a good job of it so definitely worth making the list so what about you what's your next one uh my next one was also a late edition because i didn't even realize they had had an album come out i think it may technically be an ep but it's like 40 minutes long and i got albums on here that are shorter than that that are lps um and that is cult of luna's the raging river uh you're the one who turned me on to cult of luna way way back in the day when i think their second album came out the beyond yep Yes, which is a great album. Oh, yeah. And you know what? They just keep putting out bangers. I still think that their high point is probably their uh, their collaboration with Julie Christmas, Mariner. Uh, just an all-time. I would agree. Just one of the greatest things I've ever heard. Um, but The Raging River, I think, builds it. That's not true. Just like with many of those other bands you mentioned, when you start a Cult of Luna album, you know what you're going to get. You know what the crunch you're hearing is going to sound like. But sometimes that's the crunch you want. Totally true. Sometimes you want Frosted Flakes because you know what Frosted Flakes (laughs) taste like. And that's what Cult of Luna is. They're a huge bowl of the best Frosted Flakes you've ever had. And the Raging River is that exactly. There's nothing revelatory. There's nothing game-changing. There's nothing where you're like, I've never heard Cult of Luna do this. This is all things you've heard Cult of Luna do before, but they do it so well every single time that it was worth mentioning. Agree. Um, Again, like I said, I don't listen to a lot of metal these days, but they have consistently been one of those bands that I'm like, I want something heavy time to go pull out a cult of luna album something about the way that their production works the heaviness of their bass and and guitar lines um something about the the sludginess of their composition just really resonates with me i'm a big fan and this was a good one it was another great one i agree i agree it very nearly made my list as well um there were just for me enough other things that kind of beat it out but like you said you know what you're getting with cult of luna and honestly this many albums in one of those things that you know is it's going to be good they don't have a bad album in their catalog yep i agree with you 100 percent on mariner one of the greatest post-metal albums of all time but i just love to see cult of luna really carrying the the torch for post-metal these days i think I think they're really, at least as far as I'm concerned, they're the preeminent pulse metal band. I think so too. I'd still give it to Neurosis if those guys would just release another stinking album, but it's been almost six years now. That That's the thing. is uh, Neurosis is probably still my favorite. Given to the Rising is still an album I have on repeat all the time. Uh, you know, Through Silver and Blood is one of the most seminal metal albums that you could ever mention but they just don't do it often enough whereas cult of luna's putting it out every two years they're like here's a new one and you listen to it and you go guess what it was just as good as the last one yeah no they got a new full length coming out this march yep new one coming out this year i i know a new single and i was like great let's party all right so what's your number nine so my number nine i'm gonna give to year of no light and the album is consolamentum I had never heard of these guys before, but one of the metal blogs that I tend to frequent was writing up a review on them. And as you kind of mentioned earlier, if it has the, if it has the word post in it, that's it. I'm there post rock, post metal. I'll give it a shot. It almost never steers me wrong. Then make it instrumental. Oh yeah. You've got me. I mean, Russian circles, love them to death. Year of no light. So good. They've only got about, I think, three or four full-length albums. Every one of them, just a tour de force of post-metal, instrumental, uh, so good. And this was, again, just another example of that. They do that that push-pull, the crescendo, the decrescendo, those quiet moments followed by just crushing heavy guitars that I love so much. And this was a total winner of an album. And, And for a band I'd never heard, 
one of those exciting things where it's like, okay, not only do you have one great album to listen to, you got four. And so absolutely made it on the list. Big fan. You are speaking my language. I did not make it this far down your list when I was cursorily glancing at the things that you would put on. But if you just put them into conversation with Russian circles, I am there because they are also one of those post metal bands that I still am like, okay, I need it. I need it hard and I need it heavy. Let's let's party. Yep. I think you'll like these guys. I would say they're almost a blend of some of the intensity of Russian circles with a little bit of the longer, slower builds of like Cult of Luna, honestly. Okay. So, I mean, come on. Blend Cult of Luna and Russian circles. It's going to be great. Yikes. I'm here. I'm here. I know what I'm doing tomorrow at work. <laughs> well, what about your uh, your list? What's next? All right. So... This middle section isn't really necessarily in any order. I'm just putting them on there. Uh, but the next one I've got to mention is just a great album. It's by Godspeed You Black Emperor. I don't know how familiar you are with them. Uh, they are my favorite. They're a band that I have heard a lot of, but haven't heard a lot, if that makes sense. Oh, I, I adore them. I adore them. I remember I bought their album, uh, Lift Your Skinny Fists Like Antennas to Heaven, when I was probably 21 or 22, and I've been listening to them pretty consistently ever since. Nice. Um, that album was – and that album, I bought it on the – name of the band the name of the album and the cover and the fact that it was two cds long and that i bought it sight unseen i had never heard them before i just bought it i was at like an fye and i just bought it because it looked cool and guess what it was cool it's really <laughs> freaking good uh, awesome. and they've been doing great stuff ever since they do it is the most experimental post rock like it is just out there in the deep end and their newest album that came out this year is called uh god's p at state's end which is an inexplicable title for an inexplicable album <laughs> um but they do uh it, it it is some of the messiest but also most collaborative noisy meaningful melodic and yet empty post rock that you'll ever hear um they put out three albums and then took a long break and they've come back and done four albums since. And I think in this later period, Godspeed, you black emperor, God's P at States and is probably their best album. It's nice. very tight. It's uh, t that tight is the wrong. It's sprawling. It's always sprawling with them. It, they are a huge band. Uh, you know, I think they have anywhere between eight and 14 members at any given moment. Wow. Um, and they're all doing really weird things all at once. Uh, they are an anarchist collective, which, you know, I'm there for that. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I just they're just really weird. And they did really great work. Once again, uh, Luciferian Towers, their 2017 album was ex also extremely good. But this builds on a lot of what they were doing with Luciferian Towers um, and taking it to a totally new level. So I was really impressed with Godspeed at State Ends at State's End. Uh, if you've never listened to Godspeed, I will say Yankee UXO is my favorite still remains my favorite album of theirs 2002 album it's very good excuse my french but the al but the song motherfucker <laughs> equals redeemer is their very best album or their very best song put that on repeat and you'll be like oh, i get why Braden likes this <laughs> i'll definitely have to check them out like i said I i've heard the name uh, for years but just never really dug into them so uh, i listened a little bit last night and i again like you said i could kind of go Okay, I can see what's clicking with this. I, I can definitely see that. They're very weird. Very weird, but very good. All right, what's your next one? So my next one is, you know, it's a band that if you just tried to simplify who they are, I'd be like, not interested, pass. And that is Spirit Box with their debut full-length album, Eternal Blue. Now, Spirit Box has been around for a number of years and kind of came out of the ashes of uh, the hardcore band I Wrestled a Bear Once. Courtney LaPlante was the second vocalist for I Wrestled a Bear Once. Mike Stringer, now her, hu uh, her, her husband, they're married. He was the guitarist in I Wrestled a Bear Once. That band fell apart and they decided they wanted to create something that was, I mean, I don't know, I wouldn't say it's, it's more accessible, but it still is really interesting and intricate. But at its heart, if you had to distill it, it's metalcore. I don't love metalcore. 
but something about what spirit box is doing just clicks with me. They've got the heavy, you know, their song Holy Roller is just heavy start to finish harsh vocals throughout, but then they've got incredible, beautiful songs. I mean, the song Constance off of this album, it was written during COVID Courtney LaPlante because of COVID restrictions was unable to travel to her grandmother's funeral. And then if you watch the video, the video, I mean, it makes me tear up every single time because the song is so beautiful. And the video, the guy who produced the video had a family member dealing with Alzheimer's. And, and that's kind of the take that this, this album or this song takes is it's about loss. And it's just such an opposite to something like Holy Roller that the breadth sure. of what this band can pull off is really what draws me to them. Again, Courtney has amazing, ethereal, clean vocals, but can scream and growl with the best of them. Mike Stringer, the guitarist, he plays really heavy, just kind of chunky riffs, but at the same time, beautiful, clean, intricate passages that just elevate the music to something above and beyond what most metalcore bands are doing. Um, I, I love them. Every new single that they'd released, I was all for it. And the whole album came out and it is a beautiful album start to finish. It's recorded and written in such a way that that's how you're supposed to listen to it, which I love because I'm very much an album sort of person. I like to put on an album start to finish Same. Go through the journey. And so much music these days doesn't focus on the album. It's about the singles. But this, the songs all flow directly one from the next. And in some cases, it's almost hard to tell where one stops and the next starts. And it, it's a great album. And I'm just going to be honest. I think Spirit Box is cool as hell. Like they're just, they seem as down to earth as you can be when, you know, you're really, I mean, they're on the rise. They're super popular. But um, I've been in Zoom calls with the band members. I actually was able to join a Zoom call the day before the album released where they played each song and then the band would talk about it with those of us who are in the zoom call. That's cool. And so, um, you know, great album, great band, been watching them and listening to them for a few years. And this debut full length of theirs just hit it out of the park. It's so good. Very cool. I will definitely have to check them out. All right. So what you got, what's next? All right. My next album, uh, is another bit of a swerve. Um, this is there is a rapper her name is china um she had her first lp come out this last year i had been a big fan of her two eps that had come out previously her lp is called drug opera um and this is i would best describe it as hmm fuzz drug trip hop <laughs> that's what i would describe it as um it is extremely just fuzzy is the way that I would describe the beats that she raps to um, and the backing tracks um, and her rap is just very conversational it is not the bombast uh, that a lot of uh, hip hop artists might uh, cling to but there is a, an intimacy and a, 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 a and just kind of like a realism to it that feels like you are in a basement with someone on the turntables and she has picked up a mic and she is just spitting verses over this turntable that is just spinning and and she is bringing you into the world that she is creating through her music um and i think that the this the grimy fuzz the 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 crunchiness of it uh really works to the benefit of the of the album as a whole i was very impressed by it i was really excited to see that she had finally had an lp out because i'd been so impressed with her eps um music to die for is one of those uh eps that shocked me when i heard it the first time and i was like i can't wait to see what this person does and i think drug opera builds a lot on what she did on music to die for uh, and, and does so really effectively. It's just really, really moving uh, and and sinister in a way yeah. uh, that works really well for me. I really liked it. So I listened to a little bit of this, and the word I would have used was filthy in a good way. Yeah. Like, like just like there were just some drops and some beats and things that were being thrown down that I was like, oh, that is filthy. I love it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I could definitely see where where you're like oh yeah no this this is my jam this clicks 
yeah it's it was it was very good it's my one hip-hop album i feel like the last honestly the last couple of years have been pretty weak uh it's, it's mf doom died the music died there's we needed a new rapper to stop in and china's doing good work she's really great nice all right what's your next album so i think the next one i'm gonna go with is the album untrue by black sites so um black sites came out of a band called trials trials was heavy trials was thrashy death metal black sites is much more traditional heavy metal sound to it and it's just really good you want soaring choruses you want big hooks you want good you know just classic heavy metal sound with a nice modern kind of polish to it black sites is great this is their third full length and honestly each one has just gotten better and better and better you know it's again it's got that classic metal feel to it with just this nice polish kind of wrapped in a more modern aesthetic great album one that uh, i've come back to time and time again since it came out because it's just so catchy it's just there's such good hooks to it it's it's a really great album nice all right how about you what's next uh, the next one I'm going to mention is one that I think we both share. So I don't know if you'll want to talk about it at the same time as me. I don't know if it'll mess up your listing. Uh, but the next one I wanted to talk about. No, nope, I was thinking I'd talk about it at the same time. Perfect. Is Mastodon's Hushed and Grim. It's a it's Mastodon. They did it again. It's a good one. Nothing new, nothing. But it's better Mastodon. It's better Mastodon is what I would say. I, I don't know about better, but I do <laughs> like it. I did t- make the case, make the case for better. So because I I enjoyed it, it made the list, but I didn't necessarily feel like it was was a step above. I felt like it was a, a lateral move. But so sell me on it being a step. See, for me, it is a much better album than the Hunter, Once More Around the Sun, or Emperor of Sand. I mean, I, I just can't get into the Hunter. I can't do it. Fair. Once More Around the Sun pulled me back a little bit, but still. It just felt almost too accessible for me. And and Old Mastodon was not accessible. I mean, no. it was it was thick, it was sludgy, but it was heavy, it was fast, it was aggressive at times. And, you know, those two albums really didn't do it. Emperor of Sand, a little bit better. I definitely listened to it more. But something about Hushed and Grim, and I think for me, it's the story behind it. And it's the fact that, you know, this was really kind of a love letter to a previous producer of theirs who passed away and you can feel that sense of loss and that emotional connection to the songs and for me that's what takes hushed and grim and makes it better than the last three albums and interestingly crack the sky which for me was the last really really good mastodon album also had a personal connection you know it had to do with one of the the members sister and and so i don't know i think there's something for me about when mastodon makes it more personal something about that just clicks with me and and hushed sure. and grim was that for me this year and i will definitely agree that it was a return to form uh i admit that i didn't know that emperor of sand came out <laughs> so because when i listen when i listen to mastodon it's either leviathan blood mountain or crack the sky those are my three albums of theirs that as it should be i mean those are astoundingly good albums I mean, honestly, my fave is probably Blood Mountain, but Crack the Sky is also very good. That was the one that I saw them touring for the first time I saw them live. I guess the only time I've seen them live. And it was one of the most fun shows. I took our sister Vanessa, and it was like them and Converge and Death Clock. And I can't remember who. High on Fire. Those were the four bands that played. It was. And it was in the old Saltair. And it was the wildest concert that that Ness and I ever went to. Just to be like, this is so. It was so much. Those four bands. It was so much. Uh and I admit I didn't get into the Hunter that much either. And so I do, I, I agree with you. Hushed and Grim feels like a return to that, that mid aughts uh, Mastodon style, which is what I want from Mastodon, which is what I really like about Mastodon. And this, uh, this album really did it for me. It was really good. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. You know, and, and one of the things I think that really points out how strong this album is, even the songs that at the beginning, I don't really care for, they're going to win me over at some point. And, you know, cause there's a few different songs yeah. that start out. I mean, there's one that almost starts out straight country 
And then, you know me, that's, I can't do country. I could do almost anything else. I can't do country. I just can't do it. <laughs> but about halfway through, that's this fair. song takes a flip and and goes to a different place with while still being true to what it started out as in such a way that I'm like, okay, For sure. no, I'm back on board. And I really enjoyed it. Is it too long? Yes, it is a really long album. It's hard <laughs> to listen to start to finish because it's so long. But... I've come back to Hushed and Grim more than any other Mastodon album since Crack This Guy. And for me, that's why I was like, this has got to make the list. For sure. I definitely agree there. All right. This next one is an interesting one. So the next one I'm going to talk about is the band is LLNN, all capitals. I don't know if you're supposed to pronounce it in some way or anything like that. Quite a name. And this is one of those. um, I found this band because they're signed to Pelagic Records. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with that label. I am not. It's the record label started by the band The Ocean. Okay. Oh, sure. I love The Ocean. I think, especially with their last couple of albums. Good, good music. You know, I think that Phanerozoic 1 and Phanerozoic 2 are two of the most interesting metal albums that have come out in the last decade. They're pushing the boundaries, I think, of, of what you expect from kind of progressive post, post-hardcore, whatever you want to put The Ocean into. And so if a band is signed to their label, that's one of those things that I'm going to go, well, at least I'll check it out. And that was the way it was with LLNN. For sure. Their previous album was what got me hooked on these guys. Unmaker, that came out in this last year, is so heavy. Cool. I don't know how to describe it other than it is. I mean, these are monolithic riffs that come with one purpose and one person purpose only, and that is to destroy everything in front of them. It is... Nominally, I would say it's probably post metal, but it is the heaviest post metal you will ever hear. But it still has those subtle nuances that I think are such a hallmark of post metal. Those moments that just pull you back from the edge of the cliff enough that you let your guard down so that then they can throw you right over the edge. And and that's what Unmaker is. It is probably the heaviest album I heard at least the last year. And uh, it's... It's cool. It is post-metal, just cranked up to 11, and I love it. Very cool. That sounds very cool. I'm going to have to definitely check that one out. All right, so what else you got for us? All right, my next one uh, is one that I know that you are going to really love because I know that it's one of your favorite genres of all time, and that is... Oh, oh, are we getting some country? Yeah, that is Casey Musgraves' Starcrossed, which is nominally a country album. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with Casey Musgraves. Uh, she's definitely an alt country person. She is not doing, this is not Lone Star. This is not uh, Tim McGraw style country. Uh, it's definitely more in the uh, kind of like the high women. I don't know if you're familiar with them at all. Definitely in that kind of milieu. Uh, but Starcrossed, I think, is maybe the best Casey Musgraves album uh, that she's put out so far. Her previous album, whose name escapes me this moment, uh, was about her relationship with her husband, and it was very hopeful, and it was very uh, kind of upbeat and loving and kind, and then he cheated on her and they got a divorce. And that is what Starcrossed is about. Starcrossed is the breakup album of breakup albums that I've heard in the last five or ten years. It Every song on it is filled with hurt and pain and dealing with the feeling of I put everything I had into this and you took it all away from me. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, again, it's very, it's a very quiet album. It is not, it's not a loud album. It is very intimate. It's very, it's very calm, but there is a hurt there and, and a feeling of, of loss and remorse and also resilience in the face of pain that really stunned me. I, like I say, I was really impressed with her earlier album. I really enjoyed it, but Starcrossed really crossed a line for me into, okay, this is, this is a person who I definitely want to pay attention to moving forward. This is not just an album that I turn on when I'm at work and I don't want to listen to something too heavy because other people are in the office. This is something I'm like, yo, I need to go talk to my coworkers about this album. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, it's very good. It's very, very, uh, sad but very good she's she's a really talented songwriter nice yeah definitely not familiar with her but uh that sounds like some great reasons to include her in this list 
Yeah. So what's your next one? So we're getting kind of down to it. I guess I got what, four more to go. Um, the next one I would mention is uh, De Dorn by Amenra or Amenra. I'm not sure exactly how you're supposed to say their name. I don't know if you're familiar with these guys at all. They're from Belgium. And at least on this album, all of the singing is in Flemish. And I, I listened to it and I thought to myself, I don't know what these <laughs> words are. I don't know what language this is, but it is not one of the many languages I could pick yep, apart. No, nope, it is not. Uh, so I guess I'll just enjoy the sound. Um, Amenra is, I mean, the vocalist has the most tortured scream in all of metal. It is so raw. It is so just full of pain. And I don't know how he does it. I don't know either, but it's incredible. Like every time I listen to it. I don't know how you, I don't know how this is a band that goes on tour. I don't know how you do this every night. You got to like, surely this person must have a Celine Dion style regimen where they're like, well, I did a concert. So tomorrow I don't get to speak because like, I don't know how you do that otherwise. Yeah, I, I don't either. It's incredible. But there's just this, this rawness and just this pain in their music that just resonates so powerfully. Now, Dedorn is not Mass 7, you know, and all of their previous albums uh, were titled Mass. So it was Mass 1 up through Mass 6, and this is not a continuation of that. And it feels different. It is appropriately not Mass 7. But still, there's just this, you know, almost primal, again, raw pain to the music that is so uh, emotive and just really kind of gets its claws in me and just pulls. And I love this band. And this was another great album. You know, not, I don't think it's as good as Mass 6, which is, I think, their absolute best album. But this was, again, I love it start to finish. And it does that same sort of post-metal thing where you've got these really, really quiet moments coupled with just crushing intensity. And, and that's what this album did and did so well this year. Very cool. Yeah. I, like I said, I was able to listen to some of this and I was like, whew, this is, this is a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. There's no question about that. In a good way, it is. but it's a lot. So, so what else you got for us? All right. My next one, also one of your very favorite genres, uh, is Yaga Yazist's The Tower. Um, Yaga Yazist is kind of a experimental, like jazz band, I would say. Um, it's a large jazz, you know, it's lots of saxophones. So I know that you're <laughs> really into it since I know you're the biggest saxophone fan. It's true. Uh, that it's I true. Know, I really am. Uh, personally, every time I hear a saxophone, I think to myself, oh, Peter would love oh, this song so, so much. True. Uh, but anyway, Yaga Yazis is a large, I believe they're Swedish, uh, jazz ensemble. And there's nothing really, uh, there's nothing really remarkable to say about the tower other than it's more of a return to form, uh, than their previous album. Their album One Armed Bandit remains, I think, my favorite of their albums. Uh, it, it is just really emotive and 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 builds really wonderfully on what they had done previously. And then there was an album or two that kind of fell apart for me. I didn't find them. It, I guess it was really just the one. It was Starfire uh, that just kind of fell apart for me. Um, and the tower is good because it is a live album that incorporates a lot of new things into it. So there is a lot of unreleased from a studio recordings on the tower, which is, I think why it, it, it really caught my attention because yes, there, there are uh, live versions of some of their earlier tracks, but there's also a bunch of brand new stuff that we've never heard before building off the things that they had done previously. Uh, and I was really impressed with, with how the tower turned out. Um, especially, uh, you know, we listen to some bands that maybe are a little too, uh, generous with putting out uh -huh. live albums. It, this is especially a problem. I feel like with progressive rock and progressive metal where they put out a live album, every album, every studio dream album theater. or two, and it's too, it's too much. You're like, dog. Yeah. Th that's, I'm talking about dream theater. They do it way too much. And, but lots of other bands do too. I mean, I love rush rush is my all time favorite band. Did they need to put out a live album every four albums? No, they did not. Are they good? Yeah. I'll listen to them. They didn't need to, but I mean, come on. It was a beautiful cadence. You knew you were getting four studio albums and then a live album. Uh, it was. And and with Rush, I think it worked. It, it worked. And thankfully, it was 414141, as opposed to 111111, which is what you get with a band like Dream Theater. Yeah, no, that's too much. It's way too much. Uh, and it just sounds the same. Like, they ain't doing anything yeah. interesting. 
It's just like, oh, I can hear a crowd in the background and James Labrie's voice sounds worse because it wasn't fixed in the studio. He, he, his voice is falling apart because he's an old man yes, now. Yes, it is. Uh, and his voice was never that good to start with. It was never that good to begin with. Uh, but the tower builds on and iterates on and introduces a lot of those songs that we heard on those earlier studio albums in totally new ways. Um, and so I think that it stands on its own, even though being a live album, by the inclusion of new music, by the by the iteration that they did on their earlier work. Uh, and it's a really good introduction, I feel like, to someone who's like, okay, you said Yaga Yazis is good, what should I listen to? Well, listen to The Tower, because it covers a lot of their uh, their output, their discography, and gives you a really good end to what this band kind of does and, and, and what their push into jazz and the ways in which it incorporates um, uh, other sounds into jazz work. Nice. You know, jazz is one of those things that I feel like I can appreciate and I can admire, but I have to be really in the right frame of mind to enjoy. And that's fair. Um, you know, I think anything that kind of introduces people to that and gets people thinking about and, and at least a little more familiar with jazz music, I'm totally down with. I think it's great. So agreed. As a big jazz fan, I'm all for it. So, what's your next one? So we're getting into my top three, and I think with number three, I'm going to go with the band, and again, I don't know if I'm saying this right, Iotun, I-O-T-U-N-N, all in capitals. Uh, The band, uh, excuse me, the album is Access All Worlds, and this was a band that I'd never heard of before. They only have one previous EP that I think was released in 2016, and they dropped Access All Worlds this year, early in the year. I believe it was maybe even a February release. And I haven't been able to stop listening to it. Part of that is due to the lead singer, John Aldera. He's from um, a couple other bands, Hamfro and Barren Earth. And he just has an absolutely incredible voice. Just beautiful, soaring cleans. And then he can break out just these filthy, nasty death growls. Nice. And so on, on, on Access All Worlds, you've got this psychedelic, space-themed, progressive power death metal mix that should be too much again it's almost like this kitchen sink approach and yet the songwriting is so tight and even though you get these long songs every note feels like it matters every note feels like it's there with thought with purpose and it's just it's bombastic it's over the top but because of those vocals it still has this heartfelt connection to it that just makes what should be kind of a ridiculous overblown album actually still feel like something personal. And it's, it's great. I loved it. Been listening to it all year long. Keep coming back to it. And every time I listen to it, I go, I should listen to this album more. So it's, it's a fantastic album. Nice. I mean, that's one of the highest compliments you can pay to a new album is when you think about it, you say, I should put that on again. Definitely. You know, that's, you, you know, something stuck with you. Yep. I agree. All right, my next one is a bit of a cheat because it originally came out last year, but then the new version came out this year, and so I put it on the list because I have not been able to get enough of it since it came out last I'll year. I'll allow it. I think and that's And that right. is, it is Dua Lipa's Future Nostalgia because the Moonlight Edition came out this year. Let me preface this by saying all of the Moonlight Edition tracks can go straight in the garbage. None of them are worth <laughs> listening to. You can also take Boys Will Be Boys, the last track on the album. You could throw that in the trash. The rest of the album, however, is some of the best 90s pop that you will ever hear. Dua Lipa has a voice that is so infective, infectious. That's the word I'm looking for. (laughs) Uh, it, it gets stuck in your brain. Dua Lipa's voice is so good, and and she writes these melodies that are so poppy, um, and the music itself is so physical. Like there is a physicality to it and a sensuality to it, um, that really speaks to the type of music that she's doing. Every single one of these songs is about getting with someone in an amorous fashion. I won't lie. Like that's what the the whole album is about. Like love and sex and making out and being with a person physically. And it works every uh, boys will be boys is trash. The rest of the album is very good. 
Levitating is one of the best pop songs you will ever hear. It helps that the uh, the video, which actually also came out this year, is just 90s nostalgia ready to go straight into your eyeballs because it is animated like a Sailor Moon video. It looks like 1994 anime. Okay. Uh, brought to life with this Dua Lipa song. Um, <laughs> All right. I, I love listening. I, maybe Sailor Moon's not your jam, but Sailor Moon is my jam. I'm a big fan. And it works for me. Like, the visuals, the way that the song works, the 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 uh, way that it even incorporates things like claps into it that make you as the listener want to clap along with the song. And, and it's just a very good album. It's just really, it, it has a lot going for it uh nice don't start now also one of the great pop bangers of the last decade i would say it feels like i don't know if you're familiar with the website poolside.fm are you familiar with poolside.fm i am not well if you ever go to poolside.fm what it will do is it will turn your browser into what looks like an acid washed version of numbers filed off windows 3.1 okay uh that will that has a built-in music player that will play 90s pop as well as a video player that will play like 90s tv like uh, music videos that are not related to the music <laughs> that is playing at all commercials all this sort of stuff and it just feels like it's 1994 when you look at poolside.fm and that is how Dua Lipa's music sounds as well. Dua Lipa's music is like, Hey, do you remember 1994? Do you want to think about 1994? Cause that's what <laughs> this is. And it works for me. I really enjoy it. It's a very good album. Nice. Not that familiar, but that definitely, uh, you know, the nineties, I, they draw me back. I, I can't, I can't let them go yet. Go, go watch that, the video for levitating and you'll be like, okay, this is why Brayden likes this. This is good. This is really good. <laughs> I'll definitely have to do that. All right. So what is your penultimate, your number two album? Okay. My number two album is from the band 1914. And the title of the album is Where Fear and Weapons Meet. So 1914 is a band who is fascinated with World War I. And all of their albums deal with World War I. And this most recent album is, it might be my favorite. I don't know. It's hard to, to for me between this one and the previous one. But... 1914 plays, given the subject matter, uh, appropriately a blackened death metal. I mean, it's very much death metal, but it's got some overtones of, of black metal. And this go around, they added in some symphonic elements that just take the intensity and ratchet it up just another level. There are some really emotional songs. I mean, one of the songs is basically a letter to a family whose son was killed in the war, you know, and the lyrics are all that. It's it's this letter that's being presented to a family whose son died in the war. They intersperse the music with actual music from the era with little, you know, obviously very low quality, but recordings of speeches and stuff from that time period. And then just wrap it in this, this package of this black and death metal that I think is honestly a very appropriate style of music to deal with the horrors of World War I. And they do it in such a, a, an effective and stylistic way that, you know, really, it really kind of drives home just what a waste of human life that war and, and all war, but, but in particular, that war really was and conveys that in a way that, you know, I think would be difficult to convey without really the harshness and the intensity of the music. Uh, and it's, it is a fantastic album. Yeah, I will admit when I was uh, clicking through some of yours, I stumbled onto this one and I it stuck with me. I ended up listening to, I think, the entirety of this album uh, as I was you know, sitting at work. It's the semester is over. The building is empty. I can listen to the, hep the heaviest stuff in the world that I want to because I know no student's going to come in and be like, what is this person listening to? Uh, it was really affecting. It was, it was arresting. That's the best way that I would describe this yeah, album. It really is. And, and again, just done with such a, a sense of really, it feels to me like care for the subject matter. I mean, they realize that they're dealing with something that is very heavy and don't treat it without oh, yeah. care and, and respect for the people whose lives were touched by by this experience. And, and I, I applaud them for that. And I uh, just think that what they're doing is, is really unique, really cool. Yeah. So what have you got for us next? Is this, do you have one more or is this two more? I've, I've lost count. 
I have two more because we combined Mastodon and then I want a second, or you want a second. I don't know. Yeah, perfect. I have two more. Let's hear what you got. My penultimate one is the album For the First Time, which is the debut LP by the experimental rock band Black Country New Road. Uh, I don't know what else to really say about them. They're extremely British. Um, It is weird experimental rock uh, with... uh, a lot of instrumentation in it. Um, and they're like, for example, the first track on the album is all instrumental. And it was what I first was introduced to. Um, and then I listened to more of it and it had weird British sing talking over it. And I thought to myself, I don't know that I like this as much, but as I listened to it more and more, it really grew on me. Um, but it's very experimental rock. Um, it's not, uh, you know, it's not too heavy. It's not in the metal, uh, it, you know, milieu, sure. but it definitely has like a propulsion to it. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, what is the name of the band? Mutton something. I can't think of the name of them now. <laughs> uh, anyway, they're a weird experimental band from the mid 2000s. It definitely feels like uh, they are picking up on that. Or the band Slint. If you're familiar with the 90s band Slint, came out of the shoegaze movement, really uh, similar to Dinosaur Jr., but taking it to a way uh, a, a more propulsive, more uh, progress, or more percussive uh, movement uh, of music. Definitely in that same milieu. It sounds okay. like a Slint album from 1994, except with 2021 uh, production and and so really crisp, really poppy. Uh, it's very good. Uh, nice. But yeah, definitely in that like feels kind of like that 90s style of music or uh, Unwound. Are you familiar with Un- Unwound at all? Another 90s band. It sounds familiar, but I don't know if I could sing anything of theirs. Maybe, maybe a little uh, heavier than them. But uh, definitely in that same milieu, uh, I really enjoyed it. I really think, especially that first album or that first song on it, really sold me on the band's sound, uh, and I found it really uh, compelling uh, and really uh, ended up listening to it quite a bit this year. Uh, once I stumbled nice. onto it, excellent. All right, so album of the year, twenty twenty one. What is your winner? Drum roll, please. Brrrr. The problem with that drum roll is it's not nearly fast enough for my album of the year. <laughs> that is a good point. Album of the year for me, 2021, hands down, no question, Bleed the Future by Art Spire. There's technical death metal, and then there's Art Spire. Yeah. Art Spire has taken technical death metal, and especially, you know, really with their previous album, um, Cranked It Up. And with Bleed the Future just are doing something that nobody else out there is doing. It is insanely fast. The last song on this album, I think, comes in at around 400 and something beats a minute. This is wild. It is. It is so fast and so just this brutal, brutal technical death metal. And yet they'll have moments where it slows down or where it calms down a little bit. The distortion goes away. You get some clean guitars some nice guitar solos, things that they know how intense the music they're making is. And so they know that they've got to give you little breaks here and there. And the album is only 32 minutes long. I mean, it's eight songs, 32 minutes. Even so, the songs are so intense, they have to have little breaks in them to kind of let you catch your breath. Again, you know, I loved their first, their previous album, Relentless Mutation. I don't know. I don't know how they're going to top this. It is, I mean, Bleed the Future is faster, it is heavier, it is more intense, and still manages to have songs that have hooks. And it's not just a display of technical wizardry, because it certainly is that. But the thing that impressed me the most is, is there still songs that have these earwormy moments that kind of get stuck in you? And you're right, you're not going to hum them, but you're going to be thinking about them, and you're going to hear these little bits of songs going over and over in your head because they're so stinking catchy, even though it's ridiculously fast, ridiculously technical and heavy metal. I, I was looking forward to it when it was announced. It was one, probably my most anticipated album of the year. And I was thrilled that it totally paid off. It met all my expectations and then exceeded them. And, and no question for me, this was album of the year, 2021 bleed the future art spire. Love these guys love what they're doing. Nice. Very nice. So what about you? What's the, what's the top? 
Well, I regret to inform you that the top album of 2021 may also be the album of the decade. Ooh, um, that's saying a lot. Because it's that good. And it's all I have listened to. I, you know, I got my, I, I don't know if we chatted, but I use Spotify because I have a Spotify family account that we have given various and sundry people across the world access to because that's just what exactly. you do in the era of streaming right. services. Um, and so I'm kind of locked into Spotify because I know that if I cancel it, then five other people spread across the country suddenly can't access their music <laughs> anymore. Uh, so I keep using Spotify. And when I did my, you know, Spotify wrapped this year, it was just this album. It was just this album. Uh, it was all that showed up. My top 10 tracks were the nine movements of this album and then something else. I don't even <laughs> remember what it was. The top five tracks were just this album. It was all I listened to. I listened to it like nearly a hundred times, wow. I think over the course of the last year, because it's an album that I just keep on in the background of my life. Uh -huh. um, and I fall asleep to it many times. Many, if I can't fall asleep, I turn this on. I put the phone under my pillow so it resonates through my pillow and my poor wife doesn't have to listen to it. Uh, and it's just an album that I listen to a lot. Uh, and that is Floating Points, Pharaoh Sanders, and the London Symphony Sym Phonic Orchestra's Promises, which is a an ambient jazz album that came out early 2021. Uh, if you don't, I don't know how familiar you are with either Floating Points or Pharaoh Sanders. Not much. I, I read the little bit. Uh, there was a little blurb in Apple Music, which is for similar reasons, because my whole family uses Apple Music. I'm locked into Apple Music. You're locked into Apple, of course. And so, yeah, when I when I search for this, they had a couple paragraphs about it. And so I kind of read through that uh, and thought it was actually a pretty interesting little read. Yeah. So Floating Points is the uh, stage name, uh, artist name for Sam Shepard, who is an electronic musician. He mostly does electronica, uh, it, but he also does a lot of collaboration with other people. Um, and this is specifically a collaboration between him and Pharaoh Sanders, who is arguably the greatest tenor saxophonist to ever live. Wow. Um, I think that many people would agree with that uh, assessment of Sanders. He was in, Sanders was in John Coltrane's band back in the 50s and 60s and just has a very Sanders, if you go and you listen to other jazz music, you'll be like, oh, this person has a very Sanders-esque way of playing okay. the saxophone because that's the kind of person Pharaoh Sanders is. He is. A, He's just that iconic. He, he, yeah, it's, it's genre defining. It's like when you say, oh, this person plays the sax or the trumpet like Wynton Marsalis or, you know, you, this person plays the clarinet like Charlie Bird. It's that sort of, of iconography when it comes to uh, jazz music. And he's been around, he's like 81, he's been around for a million years, he's made a bajillion albums, and quite often his albums are uh, characterized by a she by sheets of sound, uh, which is kind of the precursor to the wall of sound idea that like became really popular, I think, in the popular parlance uh, when Pet Sounds came out uh -huh. by the Beach Boys. Um, and there are lots of other bands that I would say definitely use, you know, uh, that wall of sound uh type of music one that i think both of you and i listen to quite frequently devin townsend yep, that's exactly uh, is a composer who does walls of sound at you as you're listening to it um it, it, we talked a little bit earlier about them between the buried and me i think also does walls of sound type music um but when it comes to jazz it's often called sheets of sound uh and it's and it's a little less it has a little less oomph to it mm -hmm. uh but it still has a lot of the resonance and a lot of the uh the 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 kind of everything and the kitchen sink kind of thing that you get with wall of sound music um and that is definitely true of promises promises is one song it is a 46 minute one song nine movements and it is built off this motif that uh that floating points does starting on a harpsichord and then it moves to a synthesizer and then that motif kind of moves throughout piano synthesizer harpsichord and just mutates slightly but moves throughout the entire 45 minutes while Sanders comes in and improvises uh, just some of the most sonorous, mellifluous, melodic saxophone that you'll ever hear, even at times stopping to uh, kind of sing uh, unworded vocalized sounds in parts of it instead of playing the saxophone in it. 
And alongside all of this that's happening, there is an entire symphony orchestra that is building on those same motifs, uh, developing the late motif that is introduced in those first 30 seconds of the first movement and, and mutating it and getting loud and then backing back off, getting completely quiet. There's a series of false endings near the end of movement eight before it really calms down and then comes back in at the end of movement nine. And to me, the reason this album is the album of the year and maybe the album of the decade is because it is everything that jazz in the 21st century, electronic music in the 21st century, and uh, like classical music in the 21st century can be when you put them all together. It is the three, a group and two people at the top of their game doing something that I had never heard the likes of before. And it just, the first time I turned it on, I, this is not exaggeration. I sat in my office at work and I wept wow. the first time I heard this album because it just moved me so much. And at this point, I don't weep when I listen to it. Otherwise, I would be completely dehydrated because I listen to it a lot. <laughs> but it still has that feeling to me. Just talking about it is making me weepy a little bit. Like my eyes are watering up because I'm talking about how great this album is and how much it makes me feel wow. things and how much it makes me want to sit down and compose my own music and to and to see the world through totally different eyes and to think of things in ways I've never thought of them before. That's the way this album makes me feel. Um, and that's why I think it was so affecting to me. And I don't expect it to do that for everyone, not in any way, shape or form, but it sure did it for me. And and I just can't say enough about how much it moved me this last year to listen to this album when I knew I needed something. This was the album I would turn on, and it always made me feel something. That's awesome. I mean, that's the highest praise I think we can give music is that it, it connects with us in some truly, deeply personal and emotional way. And, and if it can make me feel something, I'm on board. That sounds amazing. It's yeah. Like I say, I don't know if you would even like it. You might listen to it and be like, well, I can see why Braden likes this, but it's not for me. But oh my God, I just can't get enough of it. It just, it moves yeah. me. It makes me feel things at a primal level in a way that music doesn't do nearly often enough. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I think that that was a, a great discussion and, and a lot of interesting stuff um, that certainly I hadn't listened to. And I appreciate you sharing that with me. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. I'm really excited about delving into, especially some of these honorable mentions I hadn't had a chance to get to. I'm going to, you know, go spend the next few days really getting my uh, my metal head back on. <laughs> well, you know, I can always do that. I tell people uh, when I'm doing certain procedures, I turn music on to try and distract them because they're awake while I'm doing them. And I always tell people, I said, I'm not good at taking requests. There is a lot of, shall we say, depth to my music library, but there's not a lot of breadth. There you go. Uh, like if it's metal, I got a crap ton of it. I'm upwards of about 40,000 songs in my music library now. But, you know, it's all going to be somehow for the most part related to metal. There are a few exceptions, but it's mostly that. So it's good for me to hear about some other things. And I appreciate you sharing that with us today. Yeah, it was a pleasure to chat with you about this stuff and uh, just kind of reflect on the year. And, you know, 2021 was a rough year for, I think, all of us. Oh, yeah. If it wasn't a rough year for you, then screw you, because it should have been <laughs> it was rough for the rest of us. Uh, it was kind of awful. Not going to lie. Was, it was awful. This last two years, every, every time I think about how much I hated 2019 while I was going through it, I just think to myself, oh, you sweet summer child. You have no idea what's headed your way. Uh huh. How how ignorant we were. Indeed. But, you know, it was really nice to sit down and reflect on the music that got me through this last year and, and to put that list together and be like, these were the things that I feel like are worth mentioning to my friend, my brother, and 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 to say these are the things that moved me. Yeah. And so it was really a, it was really a great experience for me to 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 prepare that list for us today. Yeah, it was for me as well. And I appreciate the opportunity, like I said, to kind of chat with you about it and hear about some stuff and, and, you know, just like you said, talk about the stuff that helped us get through this just disaster of the last year or two. So we appreciate everybody who gives us a listen. Um, please, you know, subscribe, let us know. This should be showing up for everybody. Once I get everything squared away in all of the normal places, you get your podcast and, We'll look forward to talking again next time about something different. And uh, 
we'll maybe move away from music and try something that's uh that's not related to music and and sit down and have a chat about that so yeah thanks for listening everyone i hope you enjoyed and i hope you were inspired to go listen to something you maybe haven't listened to before that's always the goal let's look help people experience and find some new music because new music is a great thing indeed 